David, good to have you here. Likewise. Everyone, you. welcome back to the Art Life Podcast. We have David Packhouse here. You might remember him from the epic Todd Phillips movie, War Dogs, but we've got the real man in the flesh here. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of things that you do, and I was really fascinated to learn. Mm -hmm. This is a multidimensional man we're talking to right here. <laughs> Thank you. You know, from the music mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. You've got the 10 second instant flosser now. Yes. Uh, you do acrobatics dancing. I do that. So yeah. you, you really are a modern day renaissance man. And <laughs> when I was kind of researching yeah. you, yeah. I, I felt a lot of similarities between us because I'm a serial entrepreneur also. Awesome. I kind of get those creative mm. ideas and then just go for it. And then I mm. step back and I'm like, how the hell do I have this as a company now? You know, so I feel I like you. that's one kind yeah, of yeah, thread yeah. that we have. But the big story that was, I think, a fundamental part of your youth, at least, mm -hmm. was what mm -hmm. led the, to the movie War Dogs. And mm -hmm. that was you were an uh, arms dealer in your early 20s. Yeah. Now, that is not a traditional thing that no. a 21-year-old guy finds himself doing. Yeah. So I'm sure you've answered a lot of these questions before. But mm -hmm. for personal fascination, I have to sure. ask, yeah. you know... Uh, you said in the film, at least, or your character did, that you were anti-war and anti-guns. Mm -hmm. Was that actually true, or did they do that to soften your character? Uh, I wouldn't say I was anti-guns necessarily, but I definitely was anti-war. I didn't think that uh, at the time that we should have gone into Iraq. Uh, I didn't think that was the right decision, but Afghanistan is a little more murky because you know we had to go after Al-Qaeda and... Al-Qaeda was being protected by the Taliban. So, of course, that didn't end up well. So even though we did go in there, I don't think we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, I, I was, at the time, you know, much more of a hippie. And um, I still kind of see myself as relatively anti-war, though I, I think I have a bit more of a realpolitik streak now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, because of the things I've seen and experienced. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not... Try not to be naive in the sense of like, why can't we all just get along, kumbaya? And you know, why is anyone selling guns? That's the wrong thing to do in all cases. I don't think that's actually the case. Um, I people have asked me whether I I regret being an arms dealer, and uh, I, the way I think about it is that uh, you can sell somebody a knife, and they can use it to chop their vegetables or to cut their neighbor's throat. Right? Exactly. Or to defend themselves from someone else trying to kill them. So it's, it's, all in, it's a tool. It's not necessarily bad in of itself. Um, and uh, it's all in how it's used. And the vast majority of the things I was involved in at the time was selling weapons, uh, well, ammunition, to the Afghan forces who were fighting the Taliban. And I thought that was the right thing to do because I thought the Taliban are not good for the people of Afghanistan. And uh, so I thought that it was the right thing to do to support the people fighting against them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because that actually leads mm -hmm. me into another question that I was dying to ask mm -hmm. is, I'm sure you could ask a lot if you could do it all over again, would sure. you? But my question, if you could go back and pay that cardboard supplier, <laughs> would you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's kind of hard to say because, I mean, you can't, as they say, you can't A-B test the universe, right? You don't yeah. know what would have happened if, if something else had. It could have ended up a lot worse if we had paid the cardboard guy. It could have, we could have kept the contract going uh, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, the Albanian mob could have offed us instead yeah. of him. You know, like it, it, there were a lot of other risks that could have happened. I could have gone to prison and instead of avoiding prison, I could have never had a movie made about me. So, you know, there is, there is a, I'm pretty happy with how my life is now. And therefore, if I did have a time machine, I probably wouldn't mess with it because you just don't know. Like, even if it might be good in the short term to pay the box guy and to keep that contract and to make all that money, you don't know how it would have been in the long term. So, so I'm happy with how my life is now. And so I wouldn't mess with the past. Well, it's interesting yeah. because when I look at where we're at societally mm. now, yeah. I laugh and tell people having a high profile felony yeah. is the 2024 equivalent of having a sex tape in the early 2000s. 
<laughs> you know, I genuinely uh, believe that. You know, okay, so you look at a- Anna Delvey. I don't know sure. if you know her. Uh, I, I don't. She about is. Uh, she was. She has a big Netflix show. Uh, oh, that was she's the one who scammed people. Scammed oh, okay, all the hotels yeah. and the yeah, art yeah. dealers. Yeah. And now she's, you know, uh, an artist and sure. as an agent and sure. doing a bunch of things. And good for her. So it feels yeah. like now more than ever. Yeah. There's no longer that immediate kind of pariah mm. association. I mean, mm. Jordan Belfort, we've got sure. him behind yeah, us. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it feels like, if anything, if the story's wild enough right. and, you know, you're not doing the, the things that people really, you know, avoid, you know, sexual right. assault sure. and the stuff yeah. that really is yeah. genuinely horrific. There, there are some things that are bad publicity. Yeah, there are things that are bad, but people yeah. have gotten a much thicker yeah. skin in terms of white collar crimes and some of the more yeah. exotic wild. I would certainly say that arms dealing as a 21 year old and, yeah. you know, kind of cutting corners for the U.S. government. Yeah. When I look at it, I kind of have to think I would have done the same thing. Right. You know, right. how many corners has the U.S. government cut? Mm. Oh, and, yeah. you know, do you think they would have really give a shit? I, I look at it like mm. they probably wouldn't have cared. If the ammo had showed up, do you think they would have cared? So it turned out that they actually knew the whole time. And so, and they didn't care. Yeah. You know, so, and that was proven in court because uh, when they first, when the, when the Justice Department first raided our office, uh, after they raided the office and they discovered everything and had proof of everything of what we were doing, uh, they sent an email to the army, and these emails came out in court later because you know through the discovery process. And uh, they sent an email to the U.S. Army saying this ammo is originally from China. You may want to stop taking delivery on it. And the army responded back to the Justice Department saying, "Well, this ammo is critical to the mission in Afghanistan, and if you want us to stop taking delivery on it." we're going to have to have a letter from the Attorney General of the United States. And that letter never came. So they kept on taking delivery on it for another six months after they found out that it was Chinese origin. And they kept paying for it by the aircraft load. Uh, Many millions of dollars they spent on stuff they knew was 100% Chinese, proven by emails. And um, they, only don't, they only stopped it when the New York Times published a front page article exposing it publicly. And then, they're like, then they pretended they didn't know. They're like, we have no idea this was happening. We're shocked and appalled. And, you know, and they canceled our contract. Because they don't care. Yeah, it wasn't going care. in Americans' guns. It wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not even the, the, a fact like American or Afghani. It was the quality was actually good. Yeah. They were very happy with the quality. Uh, and it was, a, it was really just a technical legal issue because... The, the ammo, it was great quality, right? It was at by far the lowest price. Yeah. And it was coming from the Albanians. The Albanians were trying to join NATO, and they, were, they had all this old Warsaw Pact ammunition that NATO required for them to get rid of. Yeah. So they were going to have to pay to dismantle it. So they were thrilled to get any they sort of They had to switch money. to 556. Five, exactly, that's exactly. They had to switch from 762 by 39 to 556, five, yeah. so to be compatible with NATO. And the State Department in Albania told us, even before we shipped, they're like, oh, yeah, this stuff is all old Chinese stuff. It's great that you guys are (laughs) shipping this to the Afghanis because the Afghanis are used to using Warsaw Pact weapons. And we, the United States, doesn't want to pay that much. And NATO caliber is more expensive. So they were were like, it's a win-win-win for everybody. It's a win for the Albanians, for the U.S. government, for the Afghanis. And the the only reason it was even an issue is because the army wrote the contract that we had with them badly. They said no Chinese ammunition could be delivered under this contract, directly or indirectly, and they didn't mention the embargo, right? The embargo was the real reason they put that restriction anyway in there, because in 1989 there was an arms the embargo. Tiananmen Square. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Tiananmen Square massacre caused an arms embargo against China, and they didn't mention the embargo in our contract. They just said no Chinese, period. So our... The, the ammo did violate the terms of our commercial contract with the army. It didn't violate the arms embargo. So it was only, so they didn't really care, yeah. right? They just, they, they messed up, right? They wrote our contract badly and they didn't want it. They just wanted it to keep going because they didn't want to deal with the whole hassle of changing the contract and then getting sued by our competitors, yeah. you know, who are like, oh, it's not fair that they get this, you know, this loophole, this, um, this waiver. So uh, they only did it when they were forced to of by course. the New York Times. The other fascinating yeah. thing is I bet in the aftermath of that, mm. they went out 
and wasted a hundred million dollars extra act, of American taxpayers' did. dollars yeah. to source it the way that they needed to yeah. legally. And that's why they didn't want to do that. And of they were, only did it because they were forced to <laughs> by the media. Yeah, they didn't want to do that. They no. knew they were going to spend way more money if they yeah. had to do that. And they were trying to keep their budget down. Well, it's interesting when I look at yeah. your legal dilemma and mm. where we're at today, mm. I guarantee there are so many similar things oh, happening absolutely. with the Russia-Ukraine war. Absolutely. Because at yeah. one side we're saying, oh, you can't source anything from Russia, right? right. but mm. someone is supplying all of those old Ukrainian weapons yeah. ammo. Yeah, yeah. You know, those yeah. are definitely coming yeah. out of some warehouse in Eastern yeah. Europe. I mean, the Russians probably won't want to source that, so I think that they would be more concerned than the Americans. But it is, but we can't pay the Russians for anything. No. But there's, I would say it's more, uh, I would not be surprised at all, in fact, I'm sure this is happening, that, that there are uh, supplies going to Ukraine that are not being done the way the law requires. No. Absolutely. You know, so the way when you're, uh, uh, the way the, the international arms dealing works is, if you want to broker a deal between two third-party countries, not within the United States, right? If you're an American citizen or you're an American company and you want to let, I'm just, you know, picking yeah. a company. Let's say you want to buy from the Czech Republic and you want to sell to Ukraine. You need to have a State Department's broker's license and you need to register the transaction with the State Department in advance of that, right? And to get a license for every specific transaction. And all that takes time. And it all takes time and it, they, you know, it's a big bureaucracy and... Ukraine is desperate Ukraine needs to get they need it. They needed it two years ago, you know, so they're desperate yeah. and everyone wants to move on it. But the government takes their sweet time. And so the, I am 100 percent sure that there are plenty of these transactions that are not going through the official State Department method. Uh, but the State Department is probably looking the other way for now. Yeah. Right. So I wouldn't recommend anyone do this because eventually it catches the, up they may be like you know what now that all that 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 uh, emergency is over now we're going to go for it yeah. now that you did what we wanted you to do now we're going to come back and you know take you down for that and it's it's the thing is is that people don't realize when they're making these uh, calculations about what the risk factors are is that these organizations are made up of individuals right and the justice department the people working in there um a lot of them, I'm not saying everybody, you know, but a lot of them are, you know, they're very, as is normal, it's, they're very career minded. And the more notches they have on their belt, the more promotions they get. And so they are looking for people to take down. Of course. Right. And if they see somebody, they're like, oh, this, like for us, for yeah. example, we probably would not have, if I guess, obviously, I don't, you can't, don't know what history would have been like, but if we had lobbied some politicians at the time, they would have looked the other way. They probably would have looked the other way. Yeah. The Justice Department knew that we didn't have any connections. We didn't have any political sway. You know, we didn't, we could have easily lobbied people. We had the money at the time. My partner didn't want to spend a penny on it. Yeah. Very, very poor uh, decision. But, um, but if we had done that, we would have had some senators call up the Justice yeah. Department and say, hey, you know, why don't you guys just let this go? These, and, the, these and are the good guys. Exactly. And, and they would have let All it go. All it takes is one congressman saying, no, 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 they're the good guys exactly. giving Chinese ammo. Yeah. We want their yeah. Chinese ammo. Yeah. And, there's, and we've seen that historically. I mean, there's, yeah. uh, there's plenty of shenanigans happen that get swept under the rug yeah. that, that the people, you know, the, the Justice Department looks the other way and they have no problem with. But... They only go after it when they're forced to politically. So yeah. it's a political question rather than a matter of justice or legality, really. So yeah. I know that films often exaggerate a lot. I know sure. that one of probably the biggest differentiator in the film is that you didn't actually smuggle those Berettas right. from Jordan into Iraq. Yes. That, I believe, was a story based on a journalist. Yeah. And he was smuggled into Iraq? So, yeah. So that story is, uh, that's the n number one question people ask me about what was real in War Dogs yeah. is uh, whether I went through the triangle of death. And no, I, I, I like to think I wasn't that dumb. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the story is based on a true story. It was uh, based on Stephen Chin, who was the screenwriter of the War Dogs screenplay. And bef the reason he got the, the job to write the War Dogs screenplay is because he had written another screenplay about another two American contractors who were on the ground in Iraq at the time. And uh, that 
that screenplay had never been turned into a movie, but it was well regarded in Hollywood circles. And in order to write that screenplay, he wanted to go to Iraq to meet them and see what their lives were like. Oh, wow. And so, but he couldn't get a commercial flight into Iraq. Yeah. So he flew into Jordan and he hired some Jordanian driver to drive him into Baghdad. But the, the driver was super cheap and he wanted to get free gas in Fallujah. <laughs> so he stopped in Fallujah, which is the most dangerous place in the entire country to, because no one was manning the gas station so he could fill up for free. And then they got, he got shot at by insurgents and he got saved by the U.S. Army. You know, so that whole scene actually did happen in real life, but to Stephen Chin. In a different... Yeah, and so when he was writing the screenplay for War Dogs, Todd Phillips, the director, uh, told him, he's like, man, these guys are like just behind a computer in the office all day. We need some action in this film. Why don't you put your story in there? And that's how that you gotta scene love got, that. got written. So I guess where I was going with that was, were you actually kidnapped in Albania? And was <laughs> no. that part real? No, I... Actually, I'd never been to Albania. Oh, really? No, no. They combined my character with someone else, uh, uh, one of my best friends. Someone else name. from AEY. Yeah, from AEY. So when we, when we realized that we needed to go to Albania to inspect it, I was going to go. But then Ephraim told me, you know, we, you know, I really need you in the office. We had like 15 employees at the time. We were managing a whole operation. Uh, we're, Albania was only one small part of the entire deal. Yeah. It was actually... Only about 10% of the value of the contract was the stuff coming from Albania. Uh, but it was the biggest logistical headache. Because yeah, there was, was a lot of higher, pro, higher ticket items exactly, on there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Like the grenades were, like, you know, just to give you a comparable, uh, the, um, the Albania, the 762 by 39 ammo, we fit about 45 tons in an IL-76 aircraft, and that cost us about, about uh, between, like, uh, almost three, a little over 300 grand, right? The grenades were about 10 times for the same weight. So it was much more valuable, the grenades and the anti-aircraft rockets and the mortar than rounds the ammo. than the ammo. It was yeah. much more value per weight. And we were making way more money on those other items. And so I was dealing with all these other countries, sourcing and doing logistics, and also dealing with Rock Island Arsenal in Illinois. That's where the um, US government yeah. uh, contracting officers were based. And so Ephraim told me, he's like, I need you in the office, you know, managing the team, managing this contract. I can't have you going off to Albania, you know, focused on this one piece of the contract. So we hired one of my best friends, a guy named Alex, uh, to go to Albania. He had just gotten out of a stint in the French military. And so he, and had, so he had some and, training yeah. and experience. He speaks three languages. So a smart, capable guy. So we sent him to Albania. But he didn't get kidnapped either. I mean, that, that entire... They need drama. Yeah, yeah. They needed drama. Yeah, there, there are a few different things. Um, but you guys did meet a Swiss arms yes. dealer who was helping you, right? Yes, yes. So Henry, uh, in the movie, his name is Henry Gerard. In real life, his name is Henry Tomei. And he's a real guy. Yeah. Uh, he, he wasn't similar to how Bradley Cooper portrayed him, but Bradley Cooper makes the character look like rough, unshaven, yeah. thick glasses. He when actually, I see Swiss, I think yeah, of yeah, refined. He, and that's how he actually was. He was a very clean-cut yeah. guy very perfect hair and suits, always shaved, you know, like very low drama, like low no profile, drama. low profile, Probably fits low drama. better in a country club than he, in a strip club with Bradley. He, he Cooper. looked, he looked like a Swiss banker. Yeah. You know, that's what he looked like. And he talked like one too. Like he, I never heard him raise his voice. He never screamed at us, you know, or anything like that. He yeah. was always super cool. And when he would talk about like ammo, it was just like, he was like talking about anything, talking you know, about just oil. like, or exactly. Just, a, just like just another product. You know, yeah. it's interesting. Um, because I, I, I've talked about this on my podcast, but I, I got in a little trouble myself mm. where my younger brother and I got into selling drugs when we were uh -huh. in you know, our teenage years mm. and early 20s. And I actually think it was a, a thankfully I got out before it got bad mm. and I was sure. able to look in the mirror and mm. I had a couple you know, come to, to God moments like, yeah. Hey, if this isn't someone telling me to stop. Sure. So I was thankfully able to turn the other direction, but I learned a lot in that experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things you realize is that at a certain point to someone else, it's uh, some scary, illegal drug, but mm. do it enough times. And it just becomes a commodity Absolutely. that you're yeah. talking about from a logistical standpoint. Yeah. yeah. And it's so like any other business. arms are just yeah. like anything else. Yeah. Yeah. It just happens to be this, you know, a little bit more zany thing. Right. You know, right, it's right, not, right. you know, it's yeah. not, it's certainly not milk. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I mean, it definitely has its own complications, you know, because it's yeah. a lot, you need a lot more licensing and, 
have to worry about the political situation because you may get like a license to move, you know, an export license and an import license to move the goods and you also need flyover permits. If you're gonna be using air freight and fly over third party countries, they need to give you permission every country you fly over to move your military cargo over those countries. So it's a lot more licensing that's required and it's more sensitive to the political situation in the world. Like in the Beretta example, that actually was a real contract that we were working on and that issue we faced where the Italian government uh, put an export ban to Iraq, that actually did mess up our contract. We ended up defaulting on that contract. We didn't drive it through the triangle of death, but that messed up our contract because the Italian government uh, put in this law, this new law. Yeah. So you are at the whims of the international political situation, which yeah. adds a whole other element of risk. But in a normal day, it is just like moving a commodity. Yeah, you just have to work on the logistics. That was one yeah. of the, the final questions I had uh, in that area of it was, I was really fascinated with the actual structure of the deals. Mm. I know that in the movie it's portrayed that you have the laundromat guy and he's yeah. financing everything, mm -hmm. but how does it really work mm -hmm. financially doing a mm -hmm. deal like that? Obviously you're not coming out of pocket $300 million to front right. the US military. Right. So is it done in tranches or yeah. walk me through the, sure. the format of that? So the way it works is, well, first of all, they don't give you an order for $300 million, right? When they give you an award for $300 million contract, it's split into what they call task orders, which is like orders against that contract. Yep. Now, uh, our first task order was only like $600,000, which was nothing. And we were panicking at the time because we thought they were like fucking with us. Yeah. They were like testing us. Um, and that wasn't even enough to fill one aircraft load. So we were gonna be fucked if they didn't give us like additional orders. Yeah. But then like a few weeks later, they gave us like a $40 million order. And then we we're like, okay, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and the way, even the $40 million, it's not like you deliver it all at once and they pay you $40 million. What you do is for every delivery against that order, let's say every aircraft load, you, they sign off on a receiving report. You know, you know like we were flying aircraft into Kabul and there's a, a U.S. Army officer there, a receiving officer, they call him, and he inspects the goods, makes sure they comply to the terms of the contract, and then he signs a, what they call a DD-250 form, which is a receiving form to confirm that he inspected it and it's all, it all matches, and then we take that form and submit it to Rock Island Arsenal, and then 30 days later, they pay us for that aircraft load, right? So we, you know, like in the example of the small caliber ammo, ammo, that's about 300 grand at a time. For the grenades, it's about 3 million at a time. So uh, what we did is because we had to deliver way faster than once a month, is we, uh, we did a factoring agreement with Wells Fargo. Yep. So that uh, we would just submit the receiving reports to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo would give us the money immediately, so we didn't have to wait those 30 days. And, uh, and then like 30 days later, the army would wire the money to Wells Fargo yep. and, uh, and they would take their cut like in that way. So they would, they would make their money you know, in that way. And we could just roll that money into the next aircraft load the next day because we got the money immediately. And that's how we kept on rolling the same. We started that contract with about $5 million in funding. Um, and we were able to finance that entire thing. I mean, we ended up delivering a little under 70 million out of the 300 million before yeah. they canceled the contract, but we were able to roll that, that money uh, Just forward. off of the first Just, five, exactly. wow. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. To think about how you can get creative financially yeah. to make something like that yeah, yeah. work. Yeah. Um, so now that, that you know, we've kind of gone through the, the war dogs part of your life and yeah. the gun running, yeah. I, I'm always really intrigued of the mental moment of, mm. I believe you got house arrest, Yes. right? So you get indicted, charged, mm -hmm. um, house arrest. I'm, I'm gonna just go out on a limb and assume that when you were indicted, it was nothing like the dramatic moment of you in an <laughs> elevator fighting with no. that from. No, that, that you, didn't, no, the way it was, uh, so we'd been waiting to be like we, so they first raided our office in August of 2007. And that was because we didn't pay the box guy, right? Yeah. And he called up the New York Times and the Insane. FBI. And, um, and uh, but then they didn't do anything for the 
Justice Department didn't do anything after that raid for like six months. The wheels of motion take time. Exactly. And they were like investigating. They, you know, they, they're blah, blah, blah. And then they, we didn't hear from them. We're like, well, maybe they're just going to let it go. And <laughs> the wheels of justice yeah, were turning. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes they don't, you know, yeah. sometimes they do a raid and they just decide they don't want to pursue it for yeah. whatever reason. Either they don't think they have enough evidence or political reasons. You know, the army's leaning on them. And the army kept on paying for more deliveries. So we're like, yeah. you know, maybe the arm, maybe the army is going to make this go they away. They need you guys. Yeah. And uh, but then the New York Times published their article and suddenly the army puts out a statement. We had no idea any of this was happening. We're shocked and appalled. We're canceling the contract, referring it to the Justice Department. A week later, the Justice Department brings charges against us. So they were already in contact with our lawyers. So pretty much what we did once they brought the charges against us is we uh, did what they call a self-surrender. So we just walked down you to the courthouse. The court, yeah. They held us in a holding cell for a couple hours. We went in front of the judge, got a bond, got out. So yeah. we didn't like go to, didn't get arrested by the FBI or anything like that. Uh, we self-surrendered. Yeah. So yeah, a lot less dramatic. Yeah. So you finished the house yeah. arrest. Yeah. And was the first project you did after house arrest beat buddy yeah so, so for for listeners out there yeah. that don't know yeah david's follow-up after yeah. the arms dealing yeah. moment of his life was you returned back to your passion of music yes and built what i think is actually really impressive thank you and i personally don't know how to play guitar i wish right. i did mm. but i actually was a hip-hop producer oh cool in high school i used to have my awesome. akai mpc yeah, yeah. 1200 nice. and yeah. make my beats and sample nice so the idea of a guitar pedal that makes beats which that's right. essentially what it does it's a yeah. guitar pedal that yeah. you can kind of click click in and out and yeah. create what like a bit a kick drum a snare yeah. so the way it works so the way i came up with it i was actually under house arrest at, at the time and uh, i was playing a lot of guitar to pass the time and of course i missed playing with the drummer uh, drums you know put the the yeah. energy into the music but no drummer's gonna bring his drum set over my apartment and no. i had the angle ankle tracking device <laughs> so i couldn't like leave my apartment um to go to the studio or my friend's houses so uh, I bought a drum machine and I was making beats on it and then, you know, get the beats to play in a loop, uh, yep. you know, after I make it so I could play along with my guitar. Uh, but every time I wanted the beat to change, like to go from verse to chorus, you know, it's not the same beat the whole song, right? I had to stop playing my guitar and press a button on the machine and that interrupted the flow of the music. I had to restart playing my guitar and I thought I need to be able to control the beat hands free. So if I want this drum machine and a pedal on the floor. So uh, I realized most guitarists aren't really looking to compose beats. They want stuff that's already made. So what we did was we created a, a massive library of beats as well as drum sets so you can have the beats on different sound types, you know, on different types of drum sets. And uh, the way the pedal works is that if you, you tap it to start, and then any additional tap does a drum fill, so it like mixes up the beat to give it that live sound. If you hold the pedal down, it does a transition beat. When you let go, it goes to the next beat, like from verse to chorus. And there's an additional uh, accessory, a foot switch you can plug into it. One does accent hits like, like kick drum or, or, or like cymbal snare or whatever that you could add additional accent hits into it. And the other button does a pause and unpause, so you can do like a hard stop and a start. And so that entire setup and you can put your own beats on it. We have software that you can put make beats and put it into yeah. the pedal as well as your own drum sets. And that entire setup allows a musician to be a one-man band. So you can play your guitar, keyboard, piano, whatever, uh, and control the beat hands-free while you're playing. So you're not like locked into a backing track, which is what most musicians do when they don't have a drummer. They just play like a backing track and they play along to it. Problem with that is then you have to play the song the same every single time. You can't like improvise, can't do a solo section or whatever. So that, so the Beat Buddy allows you to, uh, to improvise. And it's also a great songwriting tool when people are just jamming yeah, and you want to write a song. Exactly. So you're forgetting about the it's cowbell. A lot of fun. Yeah, oh, you can never have enough cowbell. You can never have, right? enough, can cowbell. Never have enough cowbell. I like that video yeah. you guys guys made that <laughs> yeah. was you with a wig right it was it was it was i, was, <laughs> I had to look twice i was yeah. like wait that's david wearing yeah. a wig nobody recognizes me when i wear the wig it's, it's my my bald head is my defining features so, right yeah i was doing my best uh, christopher walken impression so, so the, the audience could see that and see how well i did <laughs> so what was that like when you you come up with the idea yeah walk me through from ideation to execution yeah. because I've dealt with China and it oh, can yeah. be a pain. Oh, it's a massive Especially pain. when you're prototyping, Absolutely. sampling, and you're dealing with electronics, yeah. which is what made it all the more impressive. Yeah. 
And this was before Alibaba was yeah. this, you know, made it so easy to right. do so. That's true. What yeah. was your yeah. process to get a yeah. electronic device made? Right. So it, I'd never done this before. I'd you know, <laughs> never developed a product. Um, so it was uh, an entire learning experience for me. Uh, the first thing I did was I, I used literally Microsoft Paint to create a very rough, I'm not an artist, so yeah. I just like did a very rough line sketch of the pedal and with all the buttons and the dials and little arrows pointing at each component with a little text description of what each thing's supposed to do uh, so, so, that the, so that I can describe what the product should be to the end consumer, right? How the consumer would experience yeah. this. And then I Googled um, electronic products development companies uh, and I found a whole bunch of companies, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of these companies on the internet that claim to take your product from napkin sketch to store shelves. That's what yep. they call it, right? But, but so I sent them, you know, I had them all sign an NDA for whatever that's worth. <laughs> yep. and, uh, and I sent them my little Microsoft Paint sketch and had them give me quotes. And, but the quotes varied drastically. I mean, at the time, this was like, so I thought of the idea in 2011. Right. And um, at the time, my, the lowest quote was like thirty thousand dollars and the highest quote was about three hundred thousand dollars. Sounds about and, right. Yeah. And so it was like literally a 10 X difference. Yeah. And, and I had a whole bunch of quotes in the middle and I had no and you idea. You have to figure out which one exactly. makes sense. Exactly. And so, of course, at first I made the classic mistake. I'm just going to go with the cheapest. I can't tell the difference between these people. I'm just going to yeah. go with the cheapest one. I only had about thirty thousand dollars to my left of my name at yeah. the time because I'd spent all my money on lawyers to keep me out of prison. So, um, so I, you know, I was figuring, well, this is all the money I have. I'll just go with the one I could afford. Of course, that it turned, that was like, like some engineer out of China, and he it pretty much took me nine months to realize this guy's never going to build this thing. He gave me some really rough computer renders. He gave me a picture of like circuit boards, but like there was no progress, and I was like, there's no way this guy's actually going to complete this project. Luckily, I'd only spent around four grand with him, and I managed, and I had hired him through like a, a website. It wasn't Upwork, but it was similar to Upwork. So you were able to get a refund. So I was actually able to get a refund. It was difficult, but I had to threaten him. It was yeah. giving him like a one-star review, and eventually he gave me a refund, so I got my money back. But that like that was like nine months wasted. Yeah. And at the time, I was like, oh man, this is way harder than I thought. How am I gonna even do this? And I got like kind of depressed, and I was like, you know what? Let me just work on other things, and I kind of like, put that on the back burner. After about like another six, eight months go by, I bump into like a musician friend of mine. And I, I you know, we were like just talking and seeing him in a while. I told him about my idea and he's like, that is so fucking amazing. I can't wait till that comes out. When are you gonna come out with that? I want one, you know? Yeah. And he told like, he had a musician friend, he told him, he's like, and they all loved it. And I was like, man, everyone loves this idea. I should, I gotta make this. Nobody's yeah. ever made anything like this. And so I dusted off my quotes. I went through them and I realized there's this one particular quote and it was about only about 130 grand, so not that bad in the grand scheme of things. Of, um, they had the most detailed proposal. It wasn't just like a single page just parroting my- They put time into it. They put time into it, that whole plan. They, had, they broke down every aspect of development into like what kind of engineer they were gonna use and the, uh, how much time they were estimating for each component of the project. They looked like they had a real plan. And, but of course I didn't have 130 grand. I only had about 30. And so I told them, I'm like, Hey guys, I'd love to use you on this project, but I don't have the money for it. I'm planning on, once I have a working prototype, I can go to crowdfunding to Kickstarter or what Indiegogo. And I'm pretty sure that I'm going to make a de you know, raise a decent amount of money because all the musician community yeah. wants this. So, uh, but I don't have the money right now. And so they told me I got really lucky with these guys, their company out of Canada. Um, Canadians are yeah. so nice. Yeah, yeah, they really are. They're from Montreal. So easy so they're to they're do French Canadian. Like, yeah. um, and uh, they told me, look, you know, we really want to do this project for you because uh, all our other, pro they're an electrical engineering company. All our other projects was from big companies or for government agencies. And we want something that's, you know, consumer facing because that's, uh, you know, that's a whole other market we haven't tapped. So we really want to build this for you. And we're pretty confident that this is going to be a successful product because uh, their founder, the founder of their company and their lead engineer, played guitar. he was actually a drummer. Oh, wow. And he told me, he's like, I don't so you have... you got lucky. Yeah, I got really got lucky. lucky. He's like, he told me, he's like, you know, I have so many friends who are always asking me to jam with them and I don't have time to jam with them. I'm running an engineering company, but I know they would love this product. Yeah. It's not as good as a drummer, of course, but it's definitely better than any other option out there. So... 
so he made a deal with me. He's like, you put down the 30K that you have as a down payment and we'll build you a fully functional prototype, but we'll hold the, the engineering files in reserve as collateral. And then you go use that prototype to do the crowdfunding campaign. And if you raise enough money to pay us back for the engineering, you get the, the engineering files, you do with it whatever you want, you own it. If you don't, then we'll do the manufacturing and we'll get a cut of the manufacturing until we're paid back. I'm like, well, I can't, you can't fucking, say no I to can't that. say no, yeah. right? You know, and I knew, I'm like, okay, these guys are putting their money where their mouths are because if they fail to build me a functional product, they're not getting paid that extra 100K yeah. that they're expecting. So I felt very comfortable that they're going to do a good job because they had to. Um, so they actually built it in a, a record time. They built me a fully functional prototype in like, I think it was like, uh, like six, seven months, which is... I can't, these days I can't get someone to do that. So like, I don't know how they did it, but they did, they did an amazing job. I did put that uh, product on Indiegogo um, because, you probably crushed yeah, it. and it raised 350K wow. yeah, in a month. Musicians so, are active on yeah, those platforms. Yeah, yeah, they love it. They love stuff they like love that. It. Yeah, so it, and that was enough to pay them back and to get the manufacturing started. And it became a massive hit, the Beat Buddy. It's, yeah. it's uh, won a whole bunch of music industry awards. A lot of famous musicians use it. Uh, one of my favorite stories with the Beat Buddy is um, I'm a big Alice in Chains fan. You know, I'm a grunge era yeah. guy. That's, a, that's the music I grew up listening to. And at a, at a trade show, uh, the bassist from Alice in Chains, his name is Mike Inez, he came up to me. He's like, oh, you're the Beat Buddy guy. I just bought one of those like two months ago. I'm writing all my new music with it. No. And I'm like, I learned to play guitar listening to your music. That's so, incredible. Like, that's so like incredible. Yeah. I've actually got a funny yeah. Alice Cooper story. Oh, yeah? I got a golf lesson from him in Maui. Yeah. So, oh, that's so cool. So Shep yeah. Goodman, his uh -huh. manager for, you know, 60 yeah. years is a big Maui guy he's oh, been cool. there for 40 years nice and every christmas he throws this huge mm -hmm. holiday party and one of my clients spends a lot of their winter in maui and has become very close with both shep and alice cooper mm -hmm. and so i actually you know people in the art world are weird about this but i love to hunt uh -huh. so yeah, i, I flew <laughs> over to, to kona yeah, which is the sure. big island yeah and I, I hunted a wild boar, cool. which is yeah. pretty interesting because you, people think of hunting as like you're in the middle of the wild and stuff. Right. But, but actually, we were on a cattle farm oh, wow. That's and interesting. we walk yeah. up to the ranch and the guy's like, shoot as many of those freaking things as you can. They're uh, eating all my cattle uh, food and they're invasive scaring species, my, yeah, they're yeah. fully invasive. I see. And so you see when you're hunting them, right. they really are invasive. Like right. we were basically hunting them and we had to wait for them to move away from the herds of cattle oh, wow. to take shots because they're just disrupting the cattle herds right, and right. eating the cattle feed. And right. it's, you see the, the farmers yeah, yeah. are like, get rid of these things. Right. But the good thing is that they're getting the, the boar mm -hmm. are getting fed cow feed and mm -hmm. natural um, almonds and uh -huh. macaroons. Oh, so, so as far as a wild well boar fed. you're going to eat, they're delicious. Yeah, sure. So I, I shoot this wild boar. I bring it back to Maui. We do a whole spit roast with my, my client's chef, and Alice Cooper shows up. Oh, wow. And he's sitting there by himself practicing his, practicing his golf swing. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what the hell? Uh -huh. So I go up and talk to him. I'm like, oh, you, you liked golf? Mm -hmm. And my friends look at me like, you idiot. The guy plays golf five times a day. <laughs> and meanwhile, Alice Cooper's got a pink polo shirt, uh -huh. khakis, and boat shoes on. Uh, wow. The exact opposite yeah. of what his fans would think he is. So he funny. looks like he's straight out of a country club. And so I'm like, man, you know, I just slice the ball every mm -hmm. time I'm mm -hmm. up at the tee. And he says, I can fix that. What are you doing 10 a.m. tomorrow? Huh. And I'm like, really? Uh, you, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to bug yeah. you. Yeah. He's like, no, no, I'll be there anyways. Meet me at the club, 10 a.m. So I got like a 30-minute golf lesson from Alice Cooper. Amazing. I'm yeah. still terrible at golf and still shank the ball. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alice. Yeah. But he did give yeah. me some really good pointers. And That's apparently cool. I didn't get to play the round with him because mm -hmm. he had, you know, other people playing with him. Right. But apparently he's a scratch golfer. And is That's awesome. You know, he does all the celebrity tournaments. And oh, wow. Just like a very soft-spoken, incredibly yeah. intelligent guy. Yeah. And, you know, that was a special experience. Yeah, yeah. And people are looking at me like, is that Alice Cooper teaching that guy how to drive the ball? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, cool. Like That's really cool. One of, one of those wild yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, people tend to have to balance their lives out. So it's like, uh, I, it's, I know musicians like that also, like on stage, they're like wild and crazy. But like when you meet them off stage, like super soft spoken yeah. and like really chill, you know? So yeah, I know people like that too. It's well, it's like, you know, he's yeah. been doing that shtick for 40 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to be going home and eating the killing chickens in your kitchen. Right. You know, like, right, right, right. so I, I get it, but it is funny. He's probably one of the more pronounced. Mm -hmm. Some of the other ones are hip hop guys. Mm -hmm. I have, I have hip hop clients that, mm -hmm. you know, you hear them talking in front of their crew mm -hmm. and it's fuck this and fuck that. Yeah, yeah. And then they sit down with me and they're like, so what do you think the long-term investment potential <laughs> of Andy Warhol is? Right, right, right. And I'm like, what? Did you just ask me the ROI on yeah. Warhol? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, but yeah. I like that stuff. Yeah, people have different facets to them, you know? Then, so you get yeah. Beat Buddy off the ground, yeah. you do Indiegogo, it kills yeah. it. Yeah. Now you're basically mm -hmm. in the, mu the music industry. Yeah. yeah. And how did you grow that? It was trade shows yeah. and... So we went to we went to a whole bunch of trade shows. We uh, so NAM or and the yep, National Association of Music Merchants uh, is the biggest music products re uh, related trade show in the world. So we go to that every year. And uh, our second year in 2015, uh, so the Beat Buddy came out on the market in 2014. It's actually we're about to do our 10 year anniversary. We're putting out a special edition uh, in like a month. Um, it's been 10 years. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Time Good for flies. You. Yeah. Thank you. Time, it's not easy time keeping really a business open 10 years. I, I feel you, man. No, it's, it's doing really well. We have a, we made a whole bunch of other products as well. We, uh, created, um, the Aerosloop studio, which is the world's most advanced looping pedal. So that records your music and plays it back in a loop and you can make a whole bunch of different layers and yep. different sections of the song and it, and it syncs with the beat buddy. So it goes in time to the beat. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. So you can, you can be like a full one man band. Uh, and play all the other instruments, not just your own. You could do the, the bass and, and the keyboard, and then you could do harmonies on your vocals. And so it's like you can really do everything. Yeah. And um, we've created a few other music products as well. And so we go to NAM every year, and we won uh, our second year in 2015, we won the NAM Best in Show Award, wow. which is like the highest. That's huge, yeah. yeah. it's the highest award you could win for a <laughs> musician related product. Uh, for for the beat buddy so and we've won a whole bunch of awards as well so yeah it's been going incredibly well I'm I'm really you know proud of uh, of my company Singular Sound and and our our people who work there we've got uh, 15 employees now good for you yeah thank you and uh, and really just kick ass people who just love what they do so it's it's really incredible that's awesome yeah. so yeah that brings me to transition yeah. to War Dogs Academy yeah, yeah. which. Uh, is I'll be honest. That's how I was yeah. introduced to you. You as a real person. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating. I was speaking with someone last night at dinner, mm -hmm. and I told them that I'm doing this uh, podcast today, uh -huh. and they said, "Oh, I just saw that guy on this advertisement on Instagram." Yeah. War Dogs Academy. Yeah, yeah. So I actually think it's pretty good for your personal brand. Yeah. Thank you. Now yeah. I believe that it looks like it's someone that was inspired by the movie mm. that got really deep into government contracting mm. and then they did they reach out to you and partner yeah. with you and yeah, tell me how war yeah. dogs academy came so, about right so the way war dogs academy came about was uh, so ever since the movie came out in 2016 it's been a while now um so yeah time flies <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're getting old so yeah for real <laughs> but um so ever since the movie came out in 2016, I've had literally hundreds, if not more than a thousand people contact me on social media, uh, pretty much begging me to teach them how to do government contracting. So people think like I'm an arms dealer, but re what the real business is, is government contracting, is selling things to the, the bureaucracy government. bureaucracy of exactly. that website. Yeah. And you know, the first thing I sold to the government wasn't even arms. It was uh, 40,000 gallons of propane. It was shipped to an Air yeah. Force base in Wyoming. Um, and we, I've sold like food and socks and all sorts of random stuff. And, uh, we ended up specializing in arms and that's what we got famous for, but the real business is government contracting. So, but it's, it's a pretty technical business. You have to, there's a lot of, of hoops you got to jump through a lot of, uh, a lot of paperwork you got to get through. It's, it's kind of hard to learn it on your own. Uh, so a lot of people have been pretty much begging me to teach them how to do government contracting. And I was banned from doing yeah. government contracting for about 15 years. So I figured, well, you know, well, that's I, what I assumed. I figured yeah. the ban ended and that's where. Yeah. Well, it wasn't that the ban ended. So it, so I just wasn't comfortable 
I, I was already busy with Beat Buddy. I also created InstaFloss, as you yeah. mentioned earlier, with my brother. It's a device that flosses all your teeth for you in 10 seconds. So I've been like in the inventing space of creating new products and launching products. And, um, and uh, uh, so I, I, I hadn't done government contracting in like 15 years. And so I, I figured, well, my information probably might be a bit out of date. And, um, and I'm busy with my other businesses. But then about a year ago, a guy named Logan contacted me um, on Instagram. And he said, you know, I just wanted you to know that my partner James and I, about six years ago, we were 21 years old. And we were dead broke working, picking bananas on a farm in Australia. They're American, but they were working. Yeah. They were like, they spent all their money after traveling in Thailand. And then they heard that Australia pays good, well for like agricultural workers. So they were like slaving away and yeah. doing agricultural work in Australia. And the farm had a, a movie night. And one of the movie nights they, show, they showed war dogs. And they thought to themselves, you know, these guys are our age in this movie. If they could do this business, why can't we do this business? And they got obsessed with government contracting and they taught themselves the business. They, they got, uh, they, you know, really got obsessed with it and they managed to win like a small laundry services contract. And then they built on that and started winning bigger and bigger laundry services contracts. And nowadays they have a multi-million dollar government contracting business, mostly it's specialized in, in laundry, yeah. you know, not guns or anything, but they provide laundry services to a whole bunch of uh, army bases all over the world. And they're doing really, really well for themselves. So they just reached out to me to say thank you, you know, for the inspiration. And I thought to myself, these guys are active in the government contracting space. They taught themselves it, you know, the business, which yeah. is super difficult. Um, so I was super impressed. And I figured if anyone is up to date, it's these guys. They have, they're actively doing it. So I, I told them, hey guys, you know, I have hundreds of people asking me to teach them this business. Why don't we start something together to teach people how to do government contracting? And so that's how we started War Dogs Academy and just launched about three months ago. And so far we've had over 30 people win their first government contracts wow. through our program. That's impressive. Yeah, thank you. And, and a lot more on the way because it generally takes about, we say it's reasonable to win your first contract within 90 days, could be less. And, and those 30 students have, some of them won it within like 30 days and some of them 60 days. Um, but I would say on average, it's normal, you know, 60 to 90 days is normal uh, because it takes you about 30 days to get through all the paperwork and to bid on a contract and then they have to process the contract and award it. So that entire process can take up to 90 days. Um, so just in the first 90 days, we've had like 30 people win their first government contracts and a lot more on the way. So it's, um, it's really satisfying because before launching War Dogs Academy, whenever someone would ask me, hey, can you teach me government contracting? What I would, I'd usually have like a, a link, you know, I'm like here, you know, go, go read about it here. Yeah. And I highly doubt any of those people were successful. I mean, you have to be a real self-starter and really obsessed to, to, in order to teach yourself without any help. But with War Dogs Academy, we broke down the entire process into easy to digest modules, both video and text. So you can go through it and learn every aspect of the business in a, a clear and easy way. And I think one of the biggest values of the, of, the, of the course is that as part of that, you get access to the War Dogs Academy community, which is a forum that we have for members that uh, where they can make connections with each other. But uh, we also hired several retired government contracting officers. So people who used to work for the government deciding who wins the contracts. They work for us now. Oh, that's and, great. And they coach our students yeah. and they explain them any aspect they don't understand and they review their proposals before they submit it to the government to make sure they're not missing that's anything. That's a great value. So it's an enormous value. Yeah. And, and uh, the students who have won contracts have said that they couldn't have done it without that, without the entire course and is without our, you know, the help that our professionals are providing them. And uh, one thing I'm really excited about, in addition to that, is that we just struck a, a deal with a finance company so that our students who, uh, who win government contracts can get financing from this finance company. Yeah. So because it's one of the biggest... Operational yeah, ca yeah, capital. Exactly. Operational. Because the government only pays you 30 days later. Yeah. Most suppliers Most require... Most kids don't have that money. To, exactly. Most people who are just starting great. out, they don't, they don't have that yeah. hundred, several hundred thousand dollars to float that contract. And they usually would not get financing on their own, but under our umbrella, you know, as part of our group, uh, we made like a, a deal with the finance company. So, you know, we're That's starting great. that. So it's like a full service, everything from zero to hero. 
And one of our students, uh, her first contract, a lady from Poland, actually. So yeah, you could you be, do it from anywhere. You could do it from anywhere. You don't no. have to be a U.S. citizen. You don't need to be a U.S. citizen. You don't have to live in the United States. You could literally do it from anywhere. There are a few advantages if you are a U.S. citizen, particularly if you're like a veteran or a disabled veteran or a, a, a woman-owned business. Uh, there's, there's we can what just throw call, a vet in front of the company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there are rules about that, but we, yeah. but they, they call them set aside. So uh, the the United States is re- uh, government is required to put a certain amount of money uh, for specific groups. So like. A certain amount of money needs to go to small businesses. A certain amount of money needs to go to vet-owned businesses. A certain amount of money needs to go to to vet disabled veterans. You know, like there's even yeah. a subgroup, and or even uh, companies that are located in what they call an economically disadvantaged zone, right? So if you live in like a, a Lithuania, or, well, it, that yeah. that only applies to the United States because, oh. like for example, if you're in a rural co- yeah. place without a lot of businesses, yeah. then they give you special consideration because they want to support. Uh, the 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 geographical areas that are a little weaker in business. So there's a lot of different set asides and advantages, and we include all that in the course. How to give your company the maximum advantage in the marketplace to make your make you as as competitive as possible. Um, but you could do it from anywhere. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, as long as you are not a citizen or a, a living in a country that is like on the shit list of the United States, like you can't be a Russian living in Russia, yeah. you can't be an Iranian living in Iran, you can't be a North Korean, you know, yeah. like there are, there are certain yeah. countries that you can't. We have a couple red lines. Yes, there's a few red lines, but the vast majority of countries, you can be a citizen of that country, live in that country and bid on U.S. federal contracts. So um, it's one of the bit, most common questions we get from people who are living overseas or other who are people who are not U.S. citizens, whether they can do this business. And it's, ac- it's actually the case that they can. So we had a, a, a lady from Poland who her first contract, she won, it was just under $200,000, that contract, and she's going to make a 10% profit margin. Wow. She's going to make 20 k and that was only after one month. And Poland, that's a lot of money. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's just her first contract. Yeah. And once you, the way it works is once you win... Uh, so you could win up to a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar contract as a beginner without any experience, without or, any or, track record. Exactly, without any track record. They call it past performance yeah. in, in government speak. So, but once you have a few of those contracts, you can go for the multi million dollar contract. Yeah. So these small contracts, even she's going to make twenty k on something she worked on for a month. Yeah. And and that's just the beginning. Then she's going to now she has past performance. She could work on the bigger contracts and go up the value chain and eventually win multi million dollar contracts. So it's super exciting. Yeah. It's super satisfying for me that I'm able to turn, you know, what almost ruined my life into a business that's really thriving and that is that is spawning so many other thriving businesses. So it, it's it, because like before this, all like, as I said, all I could do is send someone a link and wish them good luck. Yeah. But now I have a whole support system and a track record of success and and people are skeptical, you know, they're like, oh, you know, because there's so many scam courses online. Well, I was going to say, because yeah. there's so many scam so many, courses. So many, yeah. And I always say, if you've got a great idea, why right. sell it to everyone else? That's what everyone but says. But the scale of the U.S. government it's, is so big yeah. that I, I really like yeah. what you guys yeah. are doing because yeah. you could yeah. never apply can, to every one ne- of those contracts. Can, so people don't realize the U.S. government puts out 30,000 contracts, new contracts, every single day. Wow. 30,000. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's impossible to even look at it. scale is there for it to support your it's, class. It's impossible. Like, yeah. l- like there's already, I think, 1.1 million businesses registered to do business with the federal government. Having a few thousand more isn't going to move the needle. No. You know, it's not going to make any difference to anyone in the industry. So, uh, so yeah, we're not worried about com- competition or competitors. No. Um, and I think overall, it's just a it's a good thing, obviously, for our students who who are able to build businesses that will support them and their families and make them indep- financially independent. But it's also good for the U.S. government because yeah. there's more competitors in the marketplace. They, on um, you know, the things that they they'll get more competitive bids and they'll save taxpayer money, all our money. Yeah. You know, will will uh, there'll be less government waste because there'll be more competition in the marketplace as well. So it's it, I think it's just a win-win for everybody and uh, it's a, just a super satisfying business that I've that I've. Well, uh, now that you're here. teaching, yeah. and you've got experience across yeah. multiple successful businesses, yes. 
What would be some universal mm. advice that you would give mm. an entrepreneur mm. starting a business today, mm -hmm. taken from your own life lessons? Right. I would say um, the number one factor of success, and, and this is probably going to be a little cliche, and it's probably cliche because it's true, is hard work. You know, that's, there's really no way around it. A lot, everyone wants a get rich easy scheme and a get rich quick scheme. And there's, and you could get rich quick and every once in a while it could be easy, but the vast majority of the time it's going to be hard as shit, you know, and you're going to work your ass off and it's going to take longer than you think it will. And you have to accept that and you have to be willing to do that. If you're the kind of person who, you know, after you uh, hit like a few challenges, uh, you're like, ah, oh, this is too much work, this is not for me, then being an entrepreneur in general is probably not good for you, uh, and, and being a government contractor in particular is not good for you, because government contracting is like playing the casino, right? You don't know who you're competing against. It's illegal for the, US, for the, for the government to tell you, if, you know, who, how many competitors you have, what prices they're bidding at, or even if you have any competitors. You might yeah. be the only person competing on the contract, yeah. and you will win that contract no matter what price you put on it, but it's illegal for them to tell you that, right? Because obviously that, that would not be good for the government. They want yeah. you to be as competitive as possible. So you could be competing against nobody. You could be competing against 25 other companies, and you don't even have a prayer uh, of I'm winning this contract. And you, and, a month and you have no idea. And, and you have to be willing to lose. You have to be willing to go through stretches of time where you are not going to be winning. Like my partners uh, in War Dogs Academy, they, they won a whole bunch of contracts in the beginning, and then they went through a six-month dry spell. Six months of not winning wow. a single. They just kept on losing, losing, losing. And they were like, man, maybe this business, even after winning a bunch of contracts, yeah. they're like, maybe this business isn't for us. And then they won the biggest contract of their lives, yeah. which just like put all their other contracts it made them look like nothing. Yeah. You know, it was several times worth more than all the other contracts combined. So you, if you're going to go into government contracting, you have to realize that this is the nature of the business. It's like a casino. You have to be willing to work your ass off. You have to be willing to lose, go through periods, uh, through hard, you know, periods of dry spells. Um, and, and you just have to make you know, your peace with that. Uh, but like, the harder you work, the more likely, you know what they say, the famous saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. My favorite you know? quote of all time. <laughs> exactly. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true because the more times you roll the dice, the more likely it is that one of those rolls are going to win. So the more contracts you bid on, the more likelihood you are going to win. But you have to be willing to lose. So my number one advice is, is work your ass off. But my number two advice is, is don't let it consume your entire life. Because if you burn out, you're not going to be able to continue working your ass off. And you need, and everybody's balance is individual. You know, there are some people who work, can work 18-hour days for years at a time. Some people cannot. Most people cannot, right? And that's okay. You have to find your balance that will work for you in the long term. Because that's, you're only going to be successful in the long term. And you need to find the balance that allows you to stick it out to the long term. Because if you just burn yourself out in a month or two months, the likelihood that you're going to achieve success in those first two months is low. But it, even if it takes you twice or three times longer than someone else working their ass off, as long as your pace of work is something that you could maintain for the long term, that's the right pace of work for you. And you have to find that for yourself, and you have to experiment and see what works for you. So that, that would be the, yeah. the, 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 the best way you know, to go about it. Building off of that and the life work balance because mm. i think honestly i tell people it might be harder as an entrepreneur i mean i, I mm. obviously own my own businesses and i never know when to say no mm -hmm. to work right because it's your company and you're yeah. i look at it like especially with art you know it's yeah, like yeah. if someone reaches out hey avery i want to buy this painting sure if i don't respond immediately sure someone else definitely will absolutely so you know it could be 11 p.m and i'm right. sitting in bed with my wife and then i grab my laptop out and I respond. Yeah, yeah. She's like, what the heck are you doing? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. stop. Yeah. Um, so going from that, your life work balance, mm. I saw one yeah. of the things that you've become passionate about is yeah. acrobatic yeah. dancing. Yeah, and yeah. tell me about that. Yeah, I don't yeah. even know what, how to pronounce it properly, <laughs> what you're yeah. doing, but it seems yeah. interesting. Yeah, so the way I got into that, this, um, I, I like I, I enjoy I enjoy physical activity. I've been you know working out. Uh, Miami has a big workout culture, yeah. as you know. You can't 
uh, it, it's too hot to wear clothes that cover you. So, you know, you have to look good. Yeah. Um, but um, I've been working out in the gym with my brother, like ever since our, you know, well, seriously, since like, uh, since I turned 30, because I realized when I turned 30, I was starting to gain weight, yeah. you know, and I was like, I, I, my dad was quite overweight at the time. I'm like, I don't want to look like my dad. <laughs> yeah. So I saw the two paths ahead of me <laughs> diverging. Yeah. I either work my ass off and maintain myself or I don't, and I'm yeah. going to look like my dad. So my, I'm very lucky that one of my brothers, I have five brothers, um, big family. I have also three sisters. So, um, all the same two parents. Uh, so one of my brothers is a workout nut, and he's very scientific about it. So he has spreadsheets and, and you know, it follows all the, the scientific uh, latest research and all that. So I got into working out in the gym with him, uh, worked out for quite a few years with him. And then, but I realized that the one thing we really skimped on was flexibility. And, you know, because like guys in the gym, they're just trying to get muscle and they yeah. don't really, maybe occasionally do a little few seconds of stretching just to warm up. But the more muscle you get, unless you actively work at it, you become less and less flexible. And the less flexible you are, the more prone you are to injury. And the, if you're, you get injured, you can't work out anymore. And then it all goes downhill from there. And so I like old people, they're all like, you yeah. know, like hunched and stuff. It's because they get less and less flexible over time and that destroys you. So uh, right down the street from me in North Miami, there was a, uh, a circus training school. Opened oh, up. yeah. That's how they yeah. started a circus training school? Circus training school. And they had a class called Flexibility and Contortion. You just walked into the circus training I, exactly. school. Exactly. And I figured if anyone knows flexibility, it's yeah. the contortionists, wow. the ones who can sit on their own head. Yeah. And it's taught by this Mongolian lady who's a professional uh, circus contortionist. And uh, because yeah, I tried like yoga and, and yoga is great. I'm not going to talk shit about yoga, but um, but it just seemed a more direct route to to achieving what I want to achieve was increased flexibility because I couldn't even soap my own back. Yeah. You know, it was getting to that point. And uh, so I started taking this class and and uh, it was very painful. <laughs> It's like an hour and a half of intense stretching and she pushes you, yeah. you know, in like the stretching position to get you right up to the limit. And uh, I got more and more flexible. And then uh, I had, was taking a dance class, um, you know, just for more uh, uh, aerobic exercise as well as fun. That one got shut down by the pandemic and it never reopened. And um, the, in the circus training school, they had a uh, class called um, um, tumbling acrobatics. They call it tumbling. Yeah. And it's, it's the kind of acrobatics where you do like uh, cartwheels and backflips and stuff like the kind of stuff the superheroes do in the movies. Yeah. And they teach you how to actually exactly. do it. Exactly. So I was like, I always thought, I'm like, man, that looks super. Every kid who wants to be able to do backflips like yeah. a superhero. And I'm like, I'm already going to these flexibility classes. I'm actually already kind of flexible now. So I could actually do some of these moves if I just had the, the skill. So I started taking those classes. And it's been super fun. It's just a, a lot, I a mean, lot of fun. Tom Brady, by yeah. the way, yeah. uh, accredits most of his longevity in yeah. the NFL mm -hmm. to really emphasizing on flexibility. Makes sense. And, and Absolutely. really working. Yeah. On, on that side of yeah. it where other guys in the NFL just pump weights. Yeah, exactly. People real emphasis on, on strength. And that makes total sense because when you don't do flexibility, you're going to pull something, yeah. right? Because you have no flexibility. So if you have a big muscle, but you have a very tight tendon, that muscle is going to rip that tendon. You know, you do, you, you uh, go into some like running jump or some position yeah. where that tendon is stretched beyond what it's normally stretched. It's going to snap. And once it snaps, it may never recover the same, and uh, and you and you won't be able to work out in the gym, and then everything else, every other aspect of your health, uh, starts to degrade. So flexibility is one of the most overlooked aspects of health, particularly amongst men. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, I so said, crucial. as I'm hunched over yeah, this yeah, microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, gonna I've, work on my posture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say these I mics mean, don't help. Yeah, we usually I mean, have the booms. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, flexibility helps with everything. It helps with your posture because yeah. it's easier to be in a, a better posture when you have better flexibility. It's easier to do sports when you have better flexibility. Yeah. It's easier to learn new things, to dance, to be good in bed. You yep. know, like all those all things. All those things require are flexibility. Significant improvements from flexibility. So yeah, so I, I can yeah. you can see in your life that yeah. you've built what appears to be yeah. a balanced yeah, you know, you. existence. Yeah, I but it's try. not easy. It's not it's easy. It's definitely not easy. And uh, I would say that it's definitely easier once you have an established business yeah. and you have employees you can pay to do a lot of the grunt work. When you're, just, when you're first starting out, 
you may need to really grind. Yep. And, and it's going to be a lot harder to do that balance. Uh, you so, can't enjoy yourself. You're stressing about how to yes, pay your rent. Yes, exactly, exactly. If you're if you're at, on, if you're living on the edge of bankruptcy, you you're know, not going to want to focus on pli- yeah, pliability. Exactly, exactly. You're not going to like spend a bunch of money to get uh, you know some classes. You yeah. Know? But you do. It's a balance in all sense. In all senses, you need to find something that will keep you from burning out and keep you from working at your business too. Yeah. So it, there may be other options like. For me personally, it's, and I think for most people, it's just easier to do things when you go to a class rather than trying to do things on your own. So that's why I go to, like, I could stretch on my own, yeah. but I know when I stretch on my own, I do maybe 10, 15 minutes of stretching maximum. When I go to the class, I do an hour, hour and a half. And yeah. that's when you make real progress. And of course, it's much easier when you have like a professional who knows, you know, what your limits are and can push you up to the limits with, yeah. and you avoid getting injured and things like that. Um, so if you could afford it, for sure, 100% do it. But there are plenty of things you could do on your own that can be good for your health and, and uh, help you achieve that balance on a budget. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of great YouTube videos out there that you can follow. Um, and, of course, not as good as in person. But, but I it's, definitely need but it. I'm going yeah, to try you know, to do some more flexibility yeah, stuff. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Yeah. It's, it. It really translates into everything else in your life. Uh, Well, I I really appreciate sitting down. You've had a very fascinating life. Thank you. Um, You know, aside from the things we discussed, is there anything else that you think we missed or that you Mm. would want to get across to our viewers while we're sitting here? Yeah, uh, well, I think most people uh, would be more interested in my InstaFloss product. Yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah, to yeah. hear quickly about yeah, that. Yeah, so I'll tell you how that started, because uh, we only mentioned it briefly. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, so I, one of my, the brother who is obsessed with working out, he's also, uh, he helped me found Singular Sound. He, mm-hmm. We co-founded it together. Uh, that's my music tech company. Um, and he's not a musician, but he's a very meticulous, organized, I'm a, more of an artist. I've, I'm the idea guy, yeah. you know, passion and he's execution and he's amazing at execution he's very very meticulous yeah. um which is great in the gym and it's also great for business yeah um but his one complaint he's not a musician though so his one complaint about singular sound even though we've it's a multi-million dollar business we've won a whole bunch of awards it's a very successful business uh but there is a limit there's a niche it's, it's a niche. niche it's a niche it's you know there's only maximum 10 percent of the population would consider themselves musicians and of those, and then maybe ten percent of them of would them, buy it. Exactly. Yeah. So the yeah. addressable market is like one percent of the population, and yeah. we've done very well in that mar- in that niche. Uh, but there is a limit to growth. Yeah. So he was always compl- He's like, we got to come up with a because we've come up with quite a lot of different ideas for musicians. Yeah. He's like, got to come up with an idea that's not for musicians that yeah. anyone can use. And so we were hanging out at my place and we were both smoking weed. Yeah. You know, that's where all my great ideas come from. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the songs I've written, yeah. you know, I've all been. Oh, if anyone's interested in hearing my original music, you could just put my name into Spotify and Apple Music. You could hear my original recorded music. Uh, so, yeah, I've written lots of songs. I've, you know, uh, never made any money from them, but uh, but it's a passion thing. Yeah. Um, so all my creativity is usually comes late at night when I'm smoking After weed and chilling. Rep. Exactly. And um, and uh, I, I vaporize my weed because I'm oh, nice. obsessed with health. So yeah. I don't I don't uh, do I don't burn it when I could avoid it. I do the the dry herb vaporizer, which just blows hot air through the weed, and you just get the vapor without any of the carcinogens and the smoke wow. particles. Yeah, you got to tell me yeah, about yeah, that yeah, off yeah, after yeah. this. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, uh, PlanetOfTheVapes.com has a whole Planet of has has a whole All bunch right. of these. They have por- portable ones. They have ones for yeah. you know home. Uh, highly recommended. Much healthier than than yeah. burning the weed. Um, it's, uh, so anyway, <laughs> a little tangent. Uh, so we were, we were smoking weed at my place and we got the munchies, of course, and we decided to eat some mango. Mango's delicious, it's yep. juicy, it's sweet, perfect munchie food, except it gets all the fiber stuck in your teeth. Yeah. And so my brother asked me, he's like, hey, um, you know, do you have like a dental floss? And I've got all this fiber stuck in my teeth. So we both go to my bathroom, we're flossing our teeth with the dental floss, and I go, and I say to him, man, Flossing is such a pain in the ass. Yeah. I wish I had a machine that could floss my teeth for me. And he looks at me, he's like, oh, we got to invent that. <laughs> if we could invent that, everyone, everyone yeah. hates flossing. Everyone knows they need to floss. Yeah. It's such a critical component of health, uh, oral health, but general health in particular, in general. Um, 
so we started spitballing ideas. We came up with a whole bunch of crazy harebrained schemes. Eventually, we settled on an improvement to the water pick. So the water pick. I was gonna say I use yeah, a water pick. A water every pick day. is great. Yeah. Water pick, and I use a water used a water pick before yeah. the Insta Floss as well. Water picks are great. They actually, if you use them properly, and that's a big caveat, they do a better job flossing your teeth than string floss yep. because the water gets under the gum line, and which string floss does not. Yeah. So, but the problem with water picks is you have to, to do it properly. You have to do it at a 90 degree angle to the gum line, yep. and you have to trace the gums, both top, bottom, and even more difficult on the inside pointing out. Yep. Right? And you can do it, but it take, there's a learning curve. You know, you need to learn how to do it. It's a skill. Most people, when they first try it, they make, they spray a big bunch of water all over their bathroom mirror and they're like, this sucks. Or they like shoot into their gum and it irritates yeah. the gum, you know, or they shoot down. So now down. I get it. So, so your invention, yeah. the instant floss, yeah. is essentially a water pick that shoots water at both sides. Exactly. Am I right? All four quads. I want so, one. Yeah, yeah. That's so, great. So it shoots, so it's like an H shaped manifold. I'd buy that for sure. And you just bite into it and yep. it shoots at, at a perfect 90 degree angle from both sides, outside and inside, and top and bottom. And all you have to do is slide it across your teeth, and it gives wow. you a perfect floss in 10 That's seconds. That's great. So yeah, it, and it works. We've been, uh, we've delivered, I think, we just started delivering a few months ago. We've been working on this project yeah. for quite a long time. It was the most difficult product I ever worked on. Um, it, way harder well, than the, you've the, got the electronic. Liabilities now you've got health stuff. There was there's uh, water pressure. Do leaks. you need FDA approval or not? Uh, so we we have the same FDA approval as a water pick. All right. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have to pay for it because yeah. we it's similar technology to the water pick. So it's we kind of in. yes, it's grandfathered in. Um, but we have done studies, and it is just as effective as a uh, water pick at the as a water pick used perfectly. Yeah. And this is much easier to use correctly because yeah. it's hard to mess up the angle, and it's much faster and easier to use. So there's no learning curve. So it's um, it's kind of like um, it, instead of a single water jet, it uses twelve water jets. Wow. So it's twelve times more water, twelve times the power in the motor, twelve times the water pressure. So that was what made it so difficult to build yeah. because every time you fix one thing, another think it was like a rubik's cube but eventually we got it and now they're available instafloss.com like instagram but flossing you know yep. instafloss.com uh instafloss.com you could check it out and uh and yeah and we're shipping to people so it's uh our customers have already told us that their dentists are, are like very impressed with the improved dental like gum health that they've had they're seeing direct they're results. seeing direct results wow. so so that's super awesome yeah and i'm we're, definitely yeah. ordering one yeah you should tell your friends yes <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, it takes a different mindset mm. to have an idea yeah. and actually see it through. Absolutely. Everyone yeah. has ideas. Everyone ideas has are ideas. cheap. I agree. You know, when, yeah. when you mentioned NDAs, yeah. I laughed because yeah. I don't even bother with NDAs right. anymore right. for a multitude of reasons, yeah. mostly of which they don't even hold up in court. Yeah, exactly. But second of which... Yeah. Take my idea. Great. If you can actually pull it off and right. do as good a job as me, right. you deserve to steal it from me. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> most people, like, yeah. especially I get yeah. these people that are like, oh, I want you to invest in my business, yeah. but you need to sign an NDA. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know. How do I trust you with it? You're right. I'm right. like, look, man, if you're even worried about right. that, you're not going to be the right founder. Right. You know? Agreed. Yeah, you need yeah. to look at it like yeah. no one's going to do this better than me. Right. No one has the vision like Absolutely. me. And, yeah. You know, sure. Take my idea of an instant flusher. Good luck, buddy. Go to right, China right. and make one. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, so. Yeah, we've actually seen some people rip us off, unfortunately, on uh, on Insta Floss, and they did a very, very bad job on it. And they were on Amazon, uh, and they got like one star reviews. Yeah. And it, we bought one and tested it. It does not work at all. It's a piece of crap. And we realize why, because it's actually a very hard product to of build. Of course, it's, yeah. There's so many details that go into it that people have no idea. Like the shape of the channels that the water shoots out of will affects how like the water hits the gum line. And we had to figure out the exact spacing of like how, sh how the, the channels are shaped, wow. how far they are from each other, you know, like what the average uh, tooth dimension is. Yep. To, so it fits the vast majority of people, you know, what, what kind of motor to use, what kind of manufacturing techniques to use so that it doesn't leak. There were so many, literally hundreds and hundreds of problems we had to solve 
over the course of about five yeah. years that it took us to build this thing. Um, yeah, the other guys, they, they copied our product. But they did an inferior they job. They did a terrible, it doesn't function at all. Like it's not, yeah. it's just, it's like a little sprinkler thing. You might as well just rinse your mouth out in the, <laughs> in the faucet. And the reviews uh, show it, you know, yeah. like on Amazon. Their product is like diving. So yeah, people can rip you off, but to do a good job is a whole other pr- issue. And, yeah. and, uh, and they also, viol- we also have patents. They violated our IP. At some point, we're going to sue them, but right now we're just focused on building our product. Yeah, you know, so so yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 quite as as you said, it's ideas are cheap, execution is everything. Exactly. That's really what That's it comes I down feel, to. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, congratulations on your yeah. success. It's always great yeah. to see someone. Yeah. Go through something, learn from it, build, and come Thank back you. stronger. Thank I think you. I that's really appreciate it. the value yeah. that I take from sitting yeah. with you. Thank you. And I can't yeah. wait to keep following War Dogs Academy, yeah. Instant Floss, Beat Buddy. Yeah. You know, what a mouthful. You've got some yeah. parent company you're building there. <laughs> yeah, Online yeah. courses, yeah. dental products, yeah, yeah. and music beats. Yeah, yeah. Music I've, and I've, I've got about 30 other ideas waiting on my spreadsheet to be executed. Well, so. I can't wait to grab dinner yeah. and talk about it because I'm just yeah. like you. You can ask yeah. my, my CMO over there. We're always yeah. cooking up random stuff. Awesome. I love David, that. David, thanks for coming. Likewise. Great talking with you. Likewise. Thank you for having me.